The time is spring 1982. The place is the Falkland Islands. The situation is as follows. The Falklands War is underway. Commando helicopter crewman Peter Gibbs and the 8825 Squadron are tasked to fly ammunition to the front lines. During a routine hover over the drop site while carrying 3,000 pounds of high explosive, crewman Gibbs notices the ground troops suddenly scatter. Then the explosions begin. This is Legacy Survival Stories. Legacy Survival Stories. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Legacy Survival Stories. I'm your host, Dan Latrimoy. I think it's safe to say that my life uh, personally has been fairly interesting um, and some would even say blessed. Uh, I've had a lot of exotic and wonderful adventures. I've also had some uh, harrowing and terrible adventures. Um, But I think it's also safe to say that my interesting life doesn't hold a candle uh, to today's guest. Uh, I would like to welcome back to the show, a friend of the show, uh, the legendary, the heroic, Peter Gibbs, ladies and gentlemen. Thank welcome you, Dan. back, Peter. Thank you, Dan. That was a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah. And I meant every word. Thank uh, you. You are, uh, as as myself, my colleagues, and those of us that uh, mutually know you, um, you're, you're a hard guy to trade stories with. Uh, you're, you've, you've, yeah. you've led a, certainly a life that is, um, uh, well, let's say I look forward to reading your memory. In fact, I'll help you edit them. That'll be a, a okay. pro bono thing I'd be happy to do. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> so uh, Peter has been on the show before, um, and we welcomed him back to the show because of his incredibly interesting life and uh, his warehouse full of um, incredible t- stories. Uh, So uh, with that said, uh, Peter, what have you got for us today? Um, Well, I I thought I'd tell you about, uh, I started as a search and rescue diver. And then, of course, um, eventually I had to go away and do something else. All right. And that's the rules of the Navy. And and so I ended up, um, or on my advice from my seniors, that it would probably be a good idea if you were to go and become a commando helicopter crewman. A commando helicopter crewman. Now, when I hear the word commando, that sounds pretty tough and hardcore. Is it, is it, is it in uh, line with what I'm thinking about? Um, it, it is in the, in the sense that uh, you, you would go and join a commando helicopter, um, if you want to call it flight training. And what that entails is that you would also learn a huge amount about the Royal Marines, who are part of the Royal Navy, and and then you would spend a lot of time of your life flying Royal Marines around, taking them to places where, you know, they have to do their work. So, uh, as a commando, uh, so you're, you're still part of the Navy, but you're flying around Marine units. So basically, you are the Navy. You're you're almost transport, but also tactical. Is that yes? Yeah, you're you're. Um, the actual commando squadrons were really basically used for the movement of troops, all right? But obviously with the Royal Marines being part of the Navy, um, we, we would work a lot with the Royal Marines, paratroopers, all these special forces type, and, and that's what we did. Okay, so uh, for the folks back home, uh, in case you missed uh, previous episodes uh, with Peter Gibbs, just a quick synopsis of um, some of Peter Gibbs's uh, colorful background, uh, uh, which includes uh, him enlisting uh, in the uh, Royal Navy uh, at a fairly young age, 17, 18 years old. 18, around. yeah. And uh, he uh, was an able-bodied, uh, sorry, an able seaman, I believe what they call it. That's right. And, Still uh, am. <laughs> <laughs> less able. Yeah. Um, and uh, he then segued uh, into a, a helicopter mechanic, uh, and that uh, then led to him working as a search and rescue diver for a number of years uh, in Her Majesty's Royal Navy. Uh, and then uh, that brings us back to where we are now for today's story, uh, where he has transitioned from that on to a, a tactical commando unit. Now, do they call it a commando unit? Um, they call them commando squadron. Really? So that's in the actual name? Yeah, that's okay. the actual name. Because it sounds uh, like, I mean, I, I don't mean any disrespect, but when you say commando, it sort of, you know, sounds like, you know, when Mike yeah. and I are talking about a, a video game or a movie where they have a commando guy, but that was the yeah. actual title. Yes, of yeah. 
and and the the reason I'm talking about this is um, this particular story is really one from the Falklands. Okay, so are we talking about the Falklands War? Yes, yeah. Okay, so uh, can you give us um, uh, an approximate year? Yeah, I can, actually. It would be round about, I think it's 82. Okay, 1982, give or take? Give or take, yeah. All right. Well, yeah. listen, we're not, yeah. uh, we're not, uh, this isn't, this isn't legal documentation. We're just trying to set the tone for those listening at home uh, approximately yeah. when this would be. All right. So this is Peter Gibbs now, and he's over in the Falklands. Um, yeah. So you've got, you've got to understand that I'm, I'm on a search and rescue unit and the Falklands War breaks out, but I'm already a commando trained crewman. All right. So I'd already done the course. And, and then what happens is I'm sat there as a search and rescue diver. And then when the actual hostilities break out, the British military say, wow, we need some more commando squadrons. So they just made one up. And uh, basically any of the helicopters that weren't being used um, were seconded to the air base that I was at. So this is the sort of military reaction slash government reaction yeah. to a, a war that yeah. that breaks out somewhat unexpectedly. Yeah. Uh, and now all of a sudden you're repurposing yeah. existing units. Yeah. Okay. And and so people that were already commando trained helicopter air crew, all right, I just got seconded to a, a squadron, a 825 squadron, which was made up of qualified helicopter instructor pilots and then pilots that weren't qualified. They hadn't finished their um, flying hours or anything like that. So they were capable of looking at the instruments and the, you know, pressures and the gauges and stuff like that, but they weren't actually, some of them weren't qualified with their actual wings. Okay. Right. So, so they, a, able to sort of operate the machine, but yeah, not, not not certified or qualified to take it into a, a, yeah, a mission. Yeah. Okay. All right. And and so they they banded this squadron together, and then we all set sail and and went to the Falklands. Okay. So you're boarding a, a well, aircraft carrier or something or a ship? Uh, no, no. They the the Brits. They we just took a lot of uh, merchant ships and put flight decks on the back. <laughs> And, and said that one will do, away, and away, away we go. go. <laughs> and 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 so, e even though I, I mean, they took the ships from the merchant navy, and what we basically did is the aircraft were on the front of the ship, and then all the living accommodation just welded onto the back, and away we went. And um, we arrived in the Falklands, and and of course, you know the the story I'm going to tell is is really one of you know. Sometimes survival is just knowing what to do at the right moment, and you'll probably survive if you're lucky. <laughs> okay, but um, the, this actual um, incident, um, we get up early one morning, like we always do, and we know what we're going to do. We go to the operations tent. They tell us that we want you to move all this ammunition up to close to the front, so that the the guns can, you know, keep harassing the Argentinians are up in the hills. So this is, yeah, so you're moving, like we're talking artillery type in? Yeah, oh, yes, yeah. You're talking, um, you know, they call them light guns, but they they weigh about 6,000 pounds each and they fire, you know, huge, great shells at people, you know. Yeah, so light, light guns being a relative term. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so um, in this particular day, I, I am flying with a, um, a very experienced pilot and uh, a makey learny pilot, if you want to call them that. Okay, I like okay. it. Makey learny. Makey learny. Okay. And, and the guy that I'm flying with, the captain of the aircraft, he is well to do and he, he, you know, is a gentleman by trade. You know, he's a, what, what we would call a private school boy. You know, he's had a good upbringing. But he's in the Royal Navy, he is a lieutenant commander, and he's a very good pilot. So you're painting a picture here, and I'm starting yes, to imagine yeah, a yeah. sort of a very straight-laced by the books. Very, yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, but he, he also knew that I, there are things that I might like to know that 
petty officer Gibbs, because I was a petty officer then, um, he might be able to help me. All right, things like petty officer Gibbs, I've got this brand new machine gun. I've just got it from stores. Do you know how to put it together? And well, yes, I do know how to put it together. <laughs> all right, and and you have to know how to put it together to make it work. You know, <laughs> and on, on the yeah, on, machine guns make great paperweights. Otherwise, I yeah, think. and and on the first night of you know being in the Falklands, uh, we're we're all what we call in the middle of the night. We stood to, you know, we've been warned now that there are. Argentinian soldiers in in the close vicinity of us and uh, of course we're all in slit trenches and now sailors and guns you know it, it, it's a little bit can be a little bit dangerous all right so we're all down in these slit trenches and everything and then up comes this certain lieutenant commander saying Penny Officer Gibbs Penny Officer Gibbs can you put this machine gun together for me I, I do. I do so enjoy when one Brit uh, makes fun of another Brit for the highbrow. I, yeah, I, I yeah. love it. Uh, okay, so he's asking so, you to put together. So I'm there, and I, I say, "Sir, sir, <laughs> get down, lie down. All right, don't you know?" So when you say slit trenches, uh, yeah, how many yeah. people are we talking? Three or four feet? Yeah, yeah. We're we're just in you know the basic um, you know to protect you from you know. The Whatever. basic thing, you know, yep. bullets, really. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he's standing there, you know, and what he's doing is he's, you know, skylighting him or, you know, he's illum illum illuminating himself against the, the moon. And Make he's standing there like Making this. a very easy target. Get, yeah, get down. <laughs> like, and and so he, he's there and I, I say to him, look, he gets in the slit, slit trench. I said, you know, now is not the time. Have you got any ammunition with you? And he goes, no. I said, well, it's no good anyway. I said, why can't we wait till it's daylight and I'll put it all together for you? And he said, a good idea. But he said, I'll stay in your trench. So we stay there. We don't get attacked by the Argentinians. But the following day, we go flying. And, and we're shifting huge amounts of ammunition up to, up to the front. And you take 3,000 pounds of high explosive underneath the aircraft. And when you bring it into the hover... When you say, sorry, underneath, so you're, you're, yeah. you're slinging it? Like slinging you're, it underneath, okay. okay. Right. And, and so when, when you bring it into where the guns are, what the, you know, the, the soldiers are doing is they'll position it so that they can get it off the, the pallets and to the gun really quickly. Okay, because they want to fire as much as they can. Well, we'd been doing this for about an hour and coming in, landing, or, you know, coming into the hover, moving the load closer to the gun. And this particular time we come in, and as we come into the hover, all right, um, I'm looking at the soldiers, they're all looking up, and they're about to grab it all and maneuver it to where they want it. As they've done on all the previous loads. Yeah, and okay. then all of a sudden, I see them all run away. And I say to my pilot, put it down, put it down. Put the load down now. And he goes, Why? what's going on? You know, like this. And I said, something's happened. They're all running away. And, and so we land quickly now. We've got 3,000 pound of high explosive. Land or? Or, or put it on the ground, okay, the load. Okay, so you're just dropping yeah, the load off. Drop, okay. Yeah, but we're not trying not to drop it because it's high explosive. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so placing it on the ground, placing it on the ground but, carefully, but not, but not putting the helicopter on the ground. No. Okay. And and so we release the load, and I say, get out of here now, move, do go somewhere, all right. And as we're pulling away like this, all of a sudden, a load of mortars drop around us. And now, a mortar, for those of you who don't know, does a lot of damage. That you can have airburst mortars, you know, that will explode in the air when they get close to the ground or they go in the ground and they explode then. All right, well, these explode in the ground, which was lucky. And it frightens him, it frightens me, and it frightens the makey learny pilot. And and so we move away, and and as we move away, he says, I've got to land on and I've got to go and have a, a cigarette like this. So for, uh, after, are we talking, this is uh, like a, uh, yeah. that scared me so badly, it rattled me, I need a cigarette? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and like the rest of us, if you smoke, you just do it in the aircraft, but he wants to land on, get out and go and have a smoke. That's fine. All right. But now we land on and we can already hear the 
uh, combat air uh, controllers. And, and what they're doing is they're talking to um, Harrier jump jets. And we can hear this on the radio and they're going to come in and they've got um, a uh, fire control officer who's sitting in the mountains somewhere and he's worked out where these mortars are coming from. And these Harriers and, are going to go in and, and yeah, light and, it and, up, basically. Yes, they yeah, and but the the funny thing is that the he gets out of the aircraft and he's standing there smoking, all right, and all of a sudden out of nowhere come these two Harriers, uh, you know, really fast and they're moving towards where we were, and then they strafe and they drop all the bombs on the side of the hill, all right, it, it is a mountain and it just erupted, and um, it, again, like I, I'm saying that. It, it was absolutely amazing because that frightened him to death even more because then he realised that, oh, we are in an actual combat zone. This is what does happen, you know. And he, when he got out of the aircraft, he said to me, I want you to sit in my seat, Petty Officer Gibbs, and don't let him touch anything. He's not allowed to touch the controls. If you have to do anything, you do it yourself, all right? So... The prim and popper pilot is putting you in the pilot seat <laughs> yeah. with the Mickey learning next to you yeah. and telling you, you that, that if, yeah. if this thing needs yeah. to fly, you're flying it. Yeah. And and it, he already knew that, I, could, you know, over the years I'd learned how to do it. You'd been in aircraft so, so much. much that you can learn how to do it by watching them. And then if you get a chance to fly it, all right, say, can I fly it? And they'll let you fly it. And, th and that is really... You know, so had you prior to this particular day, had you ever actually taken the controls? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. But um, you know that that really is knowing when to get out of it, and and just by seeing the people run away, or I I knew then that something's coming, and they obviously had some form of indicating they'd been mortared before but they weren't sure where it was coming from. And and obviously you don't want to be there no. with 3,000 pounds of eye explosive and all these... Um, While 80, people are shooting at us. Yeah, and they're 88, uh, 81 millimetre mortars, so they're big ones, you know. And uh, that was another, if you want to call it, little story. Okay. And nothing really exciting or, you know, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you are lucky. If we'd have stayed there, we'd have probably got blown up, you know. Along with a pile of other things, if, yeah, it, yeah. if anything hit that ammunition. Yeah, yeah. But you didn't, thank heavens. <laughs> All right. And then it, the um, the total, uh, if you want to call it, the watching, a, you know, two Harrier jump jets attack, are quite. it's quite amazing because it's really quite close. And, and with the technology that they had, they could pinpoint where they these people were and they strafed and they bombed and then for the rest of the day there were no mortars and that's really how life is you mm. know? yeah that's uh oof, that's that's gritty and uh yeah. <laughs> oh wow so the um no sixth sense at play there. You saw the guys on the ground scatter, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, that mm -hmm. gave you the heebie-jeebies enough to say yeah, yeah. it's time to be somewhere else. Yeah, we need to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. right. And and again, the the same sort of thing is when you're putting troops in, particularly when the the battle area is moving fast or you know coming backwards and forwards. All right, you want to know exactly where you are. All right, because one other little incident that happened was we overshot what they call the forward edge of the battle area. And when we landed, I looked to the left of the aircraft, which is what you often do, and then I could see all these soldiers dug in. And I realised that they're, they're only about 100 metres away from us. And what's, what's the problem with that? Or are these... These okay. are the baddies. Okay, these are these are not these are not your soldiers. <laughs> these, are, these are no. We, these we, are the other soldiers. These are the other soldiers. We've overshot, and now we're only about a hundred meters away from them. And the sticker troops that I've got in the back are carrying a, um, a fifty caliber machine gun. All right, 
and I shout to them where the soldiers are and they're Argentinian and the guy with the 50 cal gets underneath um, the, the aircraft and he opens fire and instead of the soldiers staying in their slit trenches they all stand up and run away and of course then you know what's going to happen he's going to shoot them and and in the meantime you know the pilot's going what the, what the hell's going on down it, the is back is this the same pilot yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's and, finally gotten over his uh, nerves a little bit and or? of course um he they're firing away and i'm con- i'm thinking holy shit all they can do now, if the Argentinians stayed there and opened fire, they'd get us because there would be nothing we could do. And you don't know that you're being shot at in a helicopter. All it is is if it hits something, you might know. Yeah, then you can but hear it, the ping, ping, yeah, ping. But then when you get back there, there'll be holes in the aircraft in, you know, in the, or in the rotor blades or something like that, and that's when you know that you've been shot at. Um, but the, the other thing is, you know, when you become afraid, which... I'm now afraid because the guy is firing and all, all they need to do is f- fire yeah. back at if, him. If they get you organized know? and shoot back, it's, it's going to be ugly. They they obviously panicked and started to run away and, and then he, he got the better of them. But we're trying to get away, so the troops are jumping out and as soon as they're out, we have to go now, all right? And you you can feel afraid and, you know, I'm, I don't mind a minute. I was afraid... And I was laying on the floor of the aircraft and I'm saying break to the right and I'm saying break right, all right, because I know that the land's sloping and we can get down there and go faster. And uh, I'm laying on the floor and I'm thinking, why am I laying on the floor? Because the fuel tanks are underneath me, (laughs) all right? And so now I try and stand up and we're going as fast as we can, turning, and I'm trying to stand up and get behind what I think might protect me. And there's nothing in a helicopter, it's just space. And and so I'm thinking, oh, I'll get back down now. <laughs> and, and of course I'm getting up, getting down, and I don't know what to do, and I'm afraid. <laughs> and, uh, I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with being afraid yeah. in that circumstance. No. And, and then I've been afraid of a lot less things than that. You yeah. put a spider in my bedroom. and uh... <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, it, you know, it, it's that sort of thing. You know, how many times have I been afraid? Lots. And, and you know... It comes at the strangest moments, you know. Like all of a sudden, I'm I'm the big crewman in the back saying they're over there, shoot at them, you know, not shouting like that. And as soon as they start shooting, I want to lie down, and so I'm laying down. And I, I still think about it today, you know. Like you, you never know what you're going to do or when when you think you might do it, you know. And uh, it, but it was just funny. And when I think of the the pilot, all right, he was the same you know he he actually when when that happened he was quite good and he, he didn't do anything wrong and he just knew that i had to stay low and go fast and turn to the right and that's what he was doing you know so interesting the 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 stress and fear affecting people different uh, same person similar circumstance but uh very different effects uh, yeah. which is one of those yeah. proof in the um uh, training is in uh, preparation, so you can try and be w- as yeah, familiar as possible yeah. with not only what might happen, but what your reaction to it might be. Yeah, and and it, it's like everything, you know. Until you actually do it, you're you're not really going to know how you're going to react. You know, um, and and it could be doing the type of job we do, you know, teaching people for the offshore, and and I always do, and I tell people, you know. I can tell you what I think's going to happen, all right? But I don't know how you're going to react if this happens, you know? And and so even though we have great knowledge of that, you know, what can go wrong and, you know, how it all should play out, you, you never really know how the individual is going to react. No, you don't. You, know? you don't. Yeah. You really don't. I, uh, I'm a big uh, believer in the... Uh, the offshore being a good example of a place where yeah. they do those uh, weekly drills, the muster drills, which is super repetitive and boring. And I and I get that people get complacent, but it's a simple, straightforward act so that even when a person is very, very afraid, yeah, even they, just taking that simple action of, all right, just yeah. grab this bag and go to the muster area, yeah. even that's a pro act. It's, a, it's an effective thing to do. But there's also that other thing is that 
you know, when you've done that sort of thing, or, you know, you've got to the muster point or whatever, there comes a time where everybody, or you might be faced with, I've got to think for myself now, what am I going to do? Am I going to jump off? Am I going to stay here? You know, so it's a fine line, you know. At some stage, you, you might have to choose, I've got to do this, otherwise I'm not going to survive. But it might be opposite what you're being told to do. That's, a, that's the other thing, you know. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed. There's uh, certainly precedent for that, too. We hear the stories from the uh, some of the survivors of Piper Alpha who yeah. uh, basically had to jump off a gigantic platform, yeah. uh, otherwise burned to death. And mm-hmm. we can see other evidence of that. And uh, I hate to bring up touchy ones, but 9-11 is a good example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people jumping out of burning buildings because jumping is better than standing there and, and mm-hmm. burning. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, but as you say... Uh, not knowing what you're because you don't really know you really don't know how you're going to react how it's going to play out and what's what's going to go through your mind and what your reactions are going to be until you're actually there yeah and and, and that's true you know it's one of those things you know you, you if you've ever been to a bad road accident you know and you and you look and you, and you think well who do I deal with first you know what am I going to do you know it, you know, and you see children and things like that, and you think, do I look after the children or, you know, is this person bleeding to death in front of me? It doesn't take long to bleed to death, you see. It's that type of thing. That'd what am I going to do? Yeah. I've had a few uh, I've had a few serious medical emergencies, but never where I had to uh, prioritize casualties yeah, in, yeah. in any way yeah. that was anything less than obvious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I never had to make a choice between the children who – might be hurt and the adult who yeah. is obviously bleeding out. I've never had to make that call. No, and, and I hope I never do. No. And, and again, in the sort of combat areas, you know, when you pick somebody up who's badly injured, um, it, it, you know, or badly mutilated to be the word, all right, the, the medics and all the, the guys that do that for a living, they're worth their weight in gold, you know. I'd rather have... You know, a team of medics around me, if I've got my leg missing, then, you know, I know the doctor probably knows how to tidy it all up and maybe stick one back on, all right? If, if you know... I'm, if, you, I, if you could just get through yeah. today. But, but you know, at the end of the day, the, the guys that are doing it all the time, you know, and they don't really get enough praise, uh, are the medics and the, the people that are in the back of the aircraft for that sole reason of keeping people alive till you get them somewhere. I can imagine that uh, an experienced combat medic would learn to do <clears throat> some tricks and some oh, yeah, like, yeah. okay, we have to do yeah. this right now or we're going to lose them. Uh, some stuff that you wouldn't even see in a, in a modern ER uh, because there's, yeah. there's it's a different mentality. And in an ER, you've got uh, backup and support and machines and lots of yeah. gear, whereas in the back of a helicopter, there's you, there's your... Your, your yeah. first aid bag yeah. uh, and, and then Often. this injured person and yeah. away you go. And it, it, it's better when you, uh, you know, um, particularly in the combat role, um, you know, in the first Gulf War, I would fly with a, a fully operational medic in the back, all right, because we knew that some of the injuries that are going to come through the door, all right, even though we can get them quickly, even though I know a lot about first aid and what to do and when to do it, all right, I might not be able to keep him alive like a, a fully booted and spurred medic could, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, their ability to do things, yeah, yeah. start suturing or yeah, start yeah. clamping yeah, things yeah. on the inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, wouldn't want yeah. to have to do that. No, no, but there we are. Okay, well, uh, I think that will take us to the end of uh, this session. Uh, I want to thank you so much again for being here, Peter. Um, your stories, as always, are remarkable uh, and interesting, and in this case, a little scary and um, a little <laughs> tense. But um, uh, it's fantastic to to talk to somebody who's been there and done the things and yeah, yeah. and thank seen you. the uh, seen yeah. the incredible things. So thanks again for uh, joining us. My pleasure, Dan. Flattery will get you everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, folks, uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, and almost anywhere you can find podcasts. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe and help us move up the charts with a five-star rating. 
We like comments and reviews, so we'd love to hear from you. If you have a story to tell or know of someone who does, please contact us at Legacy Survival Stories, all one word, at gmail.com. You can also find us at Legacy Survival Stories dot buzzsprout dot com. You're going down, you're going down. Go down. Legacy Survival Stories.